Hey there, bestie. I'm Lori Ami, your What to Read Next podcast host. Join me as we dive into exciting new reads that'll have you reaching for your TBR pile in no time. From group and mysteries to spicy romances, we'll explore it all and help you find your next favorite book. So grab a cup of tea, cozy it up, and let's discover some amazing reads together. Kat, welcome to What to Read Next podcast. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. So happy to have you here. Tell us a little bit what you've been up to. Sure. My most recent book is called You Should Be So Lucky, and it is about a grieving reporter who is assigned to cover a slumping baseball player in 1960 in New York. So we are talking, last time you were talking about the same time period, we're in the 60s, we're not in the historic, we're, it's a historical, because it's actually happened a while ago, but it's a pretty recent historical, like our parents probably lived those ages, like lived that time. So what was the process for you to write like this one with baseball and like reporters, but like they do like sports romance and historical? I actually did wind up asking my parents a lot about that era because they were like 13 and 15. Right? They they know. And that was just actually really fun. That's like one of the fun, really fun parts of writing about this time period is that so many of the, it's like an excuse to ask my mom about that kind of thing. It's an excuse. Yeah. That, and that's always fun. And also the closer you get to the present day, the easier research gets in general, right? Mm-hmm. Because and this particular period of time is, so this is 1960 and like the Mets came to New York in 1962. Okay. So this is an expansion team that arrived two years before that. And like, it's very like Mets coded. Like it is, the book is <laughs> about the fake Mets. Okay. Now this was like exhaustively documented at the time because the team was, first of all, everybody was like, People had been very upset when the Dodgers and the Giants left New York. And so people were excited to get a non yankee team, a National League team. And then the team was truly awful. And that's always exciting because something really bad is almost as fun as something really good. Yeah. And every single writer with any interest in baseball wrote about the 1962 map. Like, you have, like, literature written about it. You have Roger Angel at The New Yorker writing some of the best sports writing ever, like, mm-hmm. about that experience. And Jimmy Breslin wrote a really, really funny book about it. And so it's, and so that, being able to research that way by reading really good things, super fun. And also, like, a lot of the, Eddie, the baseball player, I base his character a lot on Mickey Mantle. Like, on, like, the, when someone is, like young and they're supposed to be like saving the team or saving the sport oh and they have too much media attention and anything they do is going to be perceived as a failure and they're like unprepared for that level of scrutiny and so there are many written about Mickey Mantle so that was like to sort of get a sense of what it's like to be in that position is a lot easier than it would be trying to write about somebody's experience like and yeah, I can imagine, like, it's just, like, it's just fun. Like, think about sports sells, like, and not just to the female audience, but to the male audience. But at the same time, there's something to be said about, like, the idea of, like, the underdog trying to win or the people who are having a bad season and then seeing how they overcome that bad season. It's, like, it just makes it much more interesting as yeah. a reader. I think that's why we, I think that is why, like, we, like, I think that we, like, underdog. We because do. we all have felt like that. And yeah. sports, essentially, we use numbers to judge whether somebody's doing good or bad in sports, yeah. right? Like, it's just, if, if you're, you have evidence if you're not doing well. And I think we find that idea of public failure to be almost reassuring because if these, if these people are failing publicly, then our, like, minor mortifying events are they're much less in comparison. I think that's part of it. And I think part of it is that we want to see people do well. And so when you're seeing somebody do badly and they can only go up, like you kind of guarantee some kind of catharsis. Yes. I actually like 
I like the underdog. I like the fruity for the one who people don't want to, they, they don't want to win. And I'm like, yeah, they'll totally you. Yeah, totally. You know, like totally. going for that, like the Cinderella stories, like those yes. are the ones who are like, yes. Yes. And also if you're rooting for the underdog and they lose, you're not surprised. Yeah. You're right? Up. Yeah. Like, you're not disappointed, maybe? Like, maybe, like, or you are, but it's not a, it's not a shock. Yeah. And also the, uh, the idea that it brings us community, it brings us connection to the to the outer world. Um, mm-hmm. Because we have a community at large who's rooting for the people that you want it or you don't want it. It just gives you a sense of, like, it's not just me. It's I'm part of a bigger picture. Yeah. As human beings, we do need community. We do need like a per like it's not a purpose, but it's like a purpose. Yes. It is and it is a community, really. Even if you never talk to another person who share who's like rooting for the same thing as you, that's still a community because you know they're out there. Yeah. That's makes you does make you feel like you're part of something and it makes it feel relevant. Yes. And you have something to share in the group chat. Yes. Exactly. Well, so- this one's that's what sports is like for, I mean, it's a, it's something to talk about. Like it's often just a way to, it, I mean, this is in the book too, where like that's some, sometimes that's what sports does for you is that it gives you a thing to talk about with your dad yeah, or your coworkers or whatever. Yeah. It gives you, it gives you that. And it has no, and it's um like a common language almost. Yeah. Awesome. So you're an audio reader. What kind of audios do you tend to listen and what type of speed do you listen to? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. I listen to you every day. Look at I will if I can get it in audio, that's how I'm reading it. I usually use yeah. my eyes for arcs for okay. Like that's and if I can't get a book in any other way, then I'll read it in any book. But it's there's only so much time I have to sit down and read a book and not do anything else. I can listen yeah. to an audio book while I'm driving people around while making dinner like that and so I do wind up reading a whole lot for that reason where it's yeah. it's not hard for me to read a kind of disgusting amount so my speed okay so 1.3 is like my minimum it's not going to be less than 1.3 okay if it gets really tense and I'm stressed out we're at like 2.5 because yeah. I'm just like I want it. That's like, that's sort of like skimming, right? Like, yeah. I don't know. You don't need to know the details of the fight scene. I'm too stressed out. I, d- I just want to move along. But, and if I really, if I don't like the book and I just need to finish it because I need resolution in my life, but then I don't want to DNF it, then it's pretty fast. Like it's yeah. we're fast yet. But yeah. what people like, it, I was actually talking to Joel Leslie, who he reads my books, he narrates my books. And he is one of he and Julia Whalen. Okay, yeah, I listened to at one point out. Okay, and like they're the only ones, and I've tried to figure out why, like what's going on there. And I think Joel does speak a little faster, and so does Julia Whalen. Yeah. Okay. But they also are they do the voices, right? Yeah. They do voices for the different characters, and like you can tell right away whether it's dialogue or a thought or yeah. right. And I don't know how they're doing this, but not all narrators can pull it off. And for whatever reason, that lets my brain, like, accept it at a slower speed because it's yeah. a story being told to me as opposed to me reading something in my head, like, which is what yeah. audio books usually feel like. I usually feel like I have to, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, like, I am actually like, I listen to a two point speed and every so often I listen a little bit faster because I process things faster. I've come to terms. Someone mentioned because I'm bilingual, I talk fast, but it's probably because I'm actually Puerto Rican and we talk Spanish really fast. Like we we cut words, we don't, we just we process. And so I need to I think one point speed is too slow. Even on podcasts, I have to mm-hmm. now like I actually edit at a higher speed just because it's just the processing. However, I would say like there's a there it depends on how fast the narrator speaks because some narrators, especially in nonfiction where there's memoirs where the author reads the book, they're really fast. And you're like, oh, I had to like blow it out. Like mm-hmm. I think they try to listen to Al Roker did a, has a curly mystery series, by the way. I didn't but, hear that. So That's I wonderful got news. a wonderful news. So the audiobooks are narrated by Al Roker. And like I'm like, well, let's just get out of the show. 
Well, <laughs> cozy mystery about the Today Show. It really comes down to it's a Today Show of cozy mysteries. And I was like, I started reading it, and he was talking so fast. And I was like, oh, slow it down so that it can be a little faster. But and I think it just depends on the narrator. And it yeah. depends. And people who are professional narrators are you're excellent and they tend to do a much better job than the non-professionals but there's something to be said about those non-professionals because they're telling you like the story how they're emphasizing i think i read the i love bravo and i let i read the daddy diaries from andy cohen and it was delightful because i just felt like i was watching a bravo show of him talking about the real housewives Mm -hmm. i did not mind going to slower pace because i was like i was so immersed in this like somebody telling me the story about like happened yeah and so housewife and this place just closed down in new york city and i'm sad about it and i was sad about that place closing down so it, it is like one of the books i read researching this book was a memoir mm -hmm. from like a baseball man and he read it and it was like totally not a professional job at all and it was yeah. and that great yeah there's a point at which he sounded like he was near tears and i was like oh i'm like i'm definitely yes. using a lot of little credits work here like where it was like this whole like, felt like i was connecting with the material in a way that i couldn't have under any other circumstances yes oh did you listen to jessica simpson's speak out tears i have not yet no. okay it's worth the time even if you're not a jessica fan you may not be like a fan or your stuff like that it is worth the time. You'll feel in the end that Jessica's, you're Jessica's BFF. Like, that's the feel that you got. She had an excellent ghostwriter. She does speak, like, thanks to ghostwriter and stuff like that. But she does such a great job narrating the story. Mm -hmm. And she does get some tea. Not all the tea, but she does give you some tea about what happened to John Mayer and all the different things. But it was, like, such a lovely experience. Like, I was, like, and people, like people have shared, like, it's a great experience to go for walks and, like, how Jessica narrates her story. Like her, her idea, like the idea that you think it is one way it's very different from what she really was going through. So that's a good one. I DNF'd Britney's because it was too triggering to understand like how an alcoholic father can be conservator to herself. And like, I just understand her childhood, like I, the little that I understood her childhood and the crap that Justin did to her. I was like, no, this is too dark for me. Yeah. And I wish that, that was exactly why I had a mix of either. It's like I heard it so good, like as a book and as an yes, audio like, too. Yes, like who is, is it, how, which De Michelle, Michelle Williams. Williams? Michelle Williams does a great narration. And you, you just have to listen to the genuine, genuine scene when Justin was like basically like goes talk to genuine, genuine, and she goes and like he asks like this inappropriate sentence, and Michelle Williams does such a great job narrating in that sentence. And you're like, gosh, you're trash. <laughs> like, you're <laughs> trash right now. But like, you're in trash. Or, well, she does the dog say, like, say in a straight face, like, genuine, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember. That's, that's so funny. Yes. But so, but I find that, like, audiobooks are a great way to want to calm you down to have, like, a better, a better intake of, of information to deal with anxiety. Like, it's not so, like, hard-hitting you on, on social media. And it's also a great way to connect with, like, a different story. Like, it gives yes. you a different sensory experience than just reading the book. So There are a lot of books that I don't think I'd be able to make it through. Yeah. If I had to actively read them. Yes. Okay. Like, any like, stress, stressful stuff is the big I'm never going to read a thriller with my eyes. Never yes. happening. But like an audio, so it's a chance for me to kind of like passively consume something I never would have read. Also for research, sometimes if I can listen, if it's a book where I'm expecting to get maybe just a couple of good tidbits, I can yeah. just let it wash over me. And I'm not really paying attention, but I'm also not being left alone with my thoughts, which is the worst thing that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so it's it's. I like that. Look, and that no, you can't do the same thing by skimming a book. That's yeah. not the same thing. Same. Um, so yeah, I, really, I was trying to remember, like, what did I do before audiobooks were as common and as accessible as they are now? Like right now, I get so many of my audiobooks from the library, either from Hoopla or from Libby. And I um, every year for Christmas, I get myself a bunch of like audio bits. Before that, I think I just must have listened to a lot of music. Like. Yeah. Oh, okay. what did I do? I think I was listening to music and like 
not even music. I either was reading or not even listening to anything. I think it was like watching. I tend to watch. I grew up watching having TV on the background. So yeah. I was too so I was used to having a reality TV show, whatever it was, like people screaming on the TV and just how they know it's the background noise. Mm-hmm, so probably mm-hmm. that's why, because I stopped watching TV in 2016. I don't know, for some reason I stopped watching it. And so it's like, I have like this, like this black hole of like no information for like a couple of years. And then I just incorporated audiobooks and I was like, okay. And some podcasts and some things like they're like a little bit of everything we probably had the 2014 podcast but about serial yes oh. i did listen to a, i was like an early adopter with podcasts yeah my oldest kid was born in 2007 and i know i was listening to podcasts yeah when... so probably we were listening yeah. to podcasts and we were like but yeah i'm like a super library user i have like 15 library cards because i do pay for non-resident cards to other places oh me too me too Great place to do. And I'm like, I get them from the library and I just like consume them. Like it's mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. I think libraries allow you to experiment and try different things without the option. Like, oh my gosh, I spend money on this. Like it gives you like, so I feel like I've tried more authors because I'm using the library more. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah. yeah. So the barrier to entry is so low. There's no reason in the whole world but why I can't read a couple pages of a book or listen to a couple of minutes and just get a sense of whether this is for me or not. Yeah, I you know I do that. Like at this moment, I think I have like 10 books out from my library. Yeah. And I'm not going to wind up finishing all of them, but they're all books that I want to try. Yeah. And that. Like there's a value in that and in, in knowing, okay, this isn't for me or okay, this, I could read this another time, but not right now. And sort yeah. of like just making a note of that. Yeah. Love that. All right. Let's talk about some recommendations. You are talking to us about some queer historical romances or queer historical books. Like, so talk to us about your recommendations, a little bit about how you came up with this list. You're okay. a queer historical author. So yeah. Um, and so. Queer historical romance is one of those areas where, like, it is difficult to find books that are not difficult, but like finding books that are intersectional, okay? Yeah. That are not super white. In other words, yes. Queer, not super white, uh, is harder than it should be. Like, I've got a list. You know what I mean? Like, like, but it's, it shouldn't be like this. Yeah. And like, a lot of them are, a lot of them are indie and yeah. I feel like that says it all right and I like this is not an individual readership problem this is not a problem that I'm that like we're going to solve like as readers this is an industry problem and I really do think that it's part of why historical romance is if it is indeed hitting a slump okay like I think that we've got to look at this as one of the factors that like, you can yeah. have queer people or you can have people of color but yeah. like not getting both and uh, except under rare circumstances and uh, as a treat. Like it is very, like that is dismaying, especially when you look at all of the, when you look at YA historical stuff and you look at fantasy historical stuff, there's, it's very intersectional. Okay. Like yeah. they're like, it's, and so why is what we think of as standard historical romance so, like in a different place? Yes. Why is that? It's not readers. It's not readers, okay? Because yes. readers are perfectly comfortable with historical elements and fantasy stuff and secondary worlds and like all of that type of thing. It's not because readers need things to take place in the present day. I really think it has to do with how the industry perceives historical. I think, I think the industry perceives historical romance as Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice, and then we had to recreate it so many times. First. But then we have to look back at the history of historical romance, and we had these non-consensual, these very books <laughs> that yeah. were the founding mothers of historical romance for the 80s and 70s, 80s and 90s. And then obviously we have shifted and we're now revisiting those old texts and we're upgrading, updating to sensibility. Yeah. And maybe you wish to spend some, and this isn't me, my opinion, this is not the industry opinion and I have no idea, but I think maybe as a reader, we should spend money not updating old tax, but we should start writing or investing yeah. on new tax that are more in line with other communities. We can yeah. still be in England, but we can look at 
other communities within England. We can look at the history of colonization in England, maybe other things. But I think it's the industry is so worried about like trying to need the 2024 sensibility that we're missing the mark on the actual things that happened in the reckoning that we had in 2020. And like, then- we just we just ignore it. It's just like, okay. yes. I think that, like, I feel like it's so grossly out of step with yeah. what readers obviously want. Yeah. But it is like, when you just, when, like, when I try to think of it as someone who isn't, like, totally embedded in the industry, right? Like, I'm like, it's like, I can't imagine what it must feel like to, like, if you don't, like, like if you are thinking about historical romance as somebody who, Everybody always says, but Bridgerton is popular, right? Okay, so if you're somebody who enjoys watching Bridgerton, right, and then you walk into your bookstore looking for a historical romance to read, okay, what are your odds of finding something that you enjoy that has the same things about, that you enjoy about Bridgerton? Okay, where, well, first of all, a lot of the appeal of Bridgerton is visual, okay, like it's stunning, right? And and the actors are gorgeous and like this. So this is like a whole, this is like a level of appeal that obviously has nothing to do with books. And like, it's also a an inclusive show. But like, you can look at it and you see right away, this is not all white thing. Yeah. And that is like, I think it is, that that is not as easy to find a historical romance. Yeah. Obviously, there are plenty, okay? It's just that. You are probably not going to see those on the table in front of you at Burns and Noble. Yeah. They're probably. Think, yeah. yeah. I think you had to seek them out. And obviously, indies are having its moment, but they always had its moment. It's just like the indies were taking the, we're able to take the risk and mm-hmm. have more edgier opportunities at doing yeah. things are because publishers, the problem is the publishers are buying things where they think are proven track record of sales. Oh. And yeah. so they're more conservative about it. And so in order for an indie to break through, they need to prove social media, they need to prove sales, they need to prove a whole lot of things to in order to get this traditional print deal or to get this stuff. Because publishers are not going to take a risk and someone is like, oh, it's going to be a flop. I'm not going to put money on things. And But it's hard to break through, like, how to find an audience. It's like, essentially, the author has to, like, put themselves out there. Yeah and put their work out there and try to find an audience and try to build a rapport and then still write books. Yeah. <laughs> right. And also like none of the, a lot of this stuff isn't free either. Like this is so you're I mean a lot of the stuff it takes when you have to the ads and the market. This is all but this is all money and effort. But it, it's but yeah anyway, I feel like I can't talk about queer historical romance without prophesying it. Saying yeah. that I ought to have more that's like there's, we ought to have more, and it's not readers' fault for not being able to find it. Yeah, right. We're like, I know that a lot of people are like, well, you're not looking in the right places. But in fact, probably true. If you don't know where the right places are to look, then you're yeah. not going to find it. Like you don't, you shouldn't have to be do. You shouldn't have to know what like it should not be on 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 Instagram. Haystack. It should not be heat need on a haystack. That you're just like like it's sometimes, and I am. A person that actually knows how to find some information but even that is still not enough like i'm like looking for books like so and so this and i'm like there is no like how do i find these books like it's like it's a mix of like seo keywords yep i feel like i'm about as well looped into queer historical romance as a person can get like yeah. i don't think and so when i asked in my writers group like I, like, I was like, I looked at, I was like, guys, like, I looked at my rec list and so many of the books are from 2019, like, yeah, help. And it turns out that a year ago, there is a sapphic cowboy romance, okay? And, or like cow, not cowboy, this is a, I haven't read it yet, okay? But it's called They Proper by M, by M. B. Ghoul, okay? G-U-E-L. And this book looks like it was written for me personally, where it's where it's like you have like a it looks like a, a rancher, and it looks like some. It's, anyway, this 1880s Wild West style. Yes. I think only one of the characters is white, so like we're already like this is better start. 
Right. It's going to be, if you're going to, in that setting, right? Like in yeah. that setting, I feel like we want some new ones. But I hadn't heard of this. It came out over a year ago. Like I hadn't heard of it. I'm not, I'm like extremely online. And like, and this book has plenty of reviews. So people read it. It's not as if this is like, this is, but anyway, I feel like there's a discoverability problem that you can't totally lay at the feet of readers. Like this is industry wide. This is mainly a publishing problem, but, and so that's, that is, like I said, it is like a little depressing. And also like, I, and also so many of the books I love that are like historical and queer are like fantasy romance or science fiction or like fantasy with a romance plot. Okay. Yeah. Like the, like the, sorry, the like, Nevo's books. Okay. Yeah. And CL Polk. Like yeah. these are, these are. I don't, maybe, maybe like publishing reviews historical romance differently when it's in a fantasy context and it's allowed to be more inclusive. Like, yeah. no, no, I don't know. No, maybe they think it's a fantasy. Right. It's, right. right. Like, so, is that it? Like, is that like, is it really just that there are executives saying, like, well, like we can have like queer people of color because it's a made up world? You know yeah. what I mean? There's not just none of that happen. Like, is that really what's going on here? Because like, yeah. I don't think I can cope with. Like, yeah, that's the only thing that's going on. But chances are, it's mostly the simplest solution. It's probably the truth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're, and they're all, but they're all right. Okay. So here's a, one book I recommend is Adriana Herrera's Island Princess Starts a Scandal, which is a sapphic world fair parents, like 1880s or 90s. And it is like unfairly hot. Like it is yeah. such a sexy book. It is, it starts, it's one of those books where like with by page 10, yeah, like you've already achieved like your fourth chili pepper, and like and it proceeds accordingly for the rest of the book, yeah. and it is like such a strong book, and uh, I kind of want to read five more just like it. Yes, and there aren't five more just like it. Well, obviously there's a series. Okay, Adriana has a, a whole series in that same. Adriana needs to write more, and I right. I was still bad saying that. Where like when people are like, you have to write fast. I'm always like, well, what if I just hide under my duvet forever? But like. But no, truly, that series is special, and it's yeah. unlike a lot of other things, while also being really clearly in the tradition of, like, historical romance, right? Yeah. Like, there's one character who's kind of like a Duke stand-in, and, like, like it's, and it's all just, like, very pitch perfect, right? Yeah. And Emma Albans, Don't Want You Like a Best Friend. Yeah. I, I read that, I listened to that in audio, and it was a really good audio book. And that book is so fun that I feel like when we're talking about like what direction is historical romance going to go in like I want people to hold that book up as something that's like different and fresh yeah okay? it's a romp it's just yeah, like it's fun it sounded like fun it's on my list I got the arc for the second book but I really wanted to listen to the really wanted to listen to that and I was like, just sound like romp and they sound like fun. They sound like this like idea of like this world, like it doesn't have to be so serious. Yes. It's there's very little tying it to any place or time. Okay. Yeah. I mean there it's very much like it takes place in historical fantasy land. And I mean that in yeah. a good way. Okay. Where it's 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 it feels colorful and like the side characters are fun and funny. It is, it doesn't, it hasn't, it feels like if at any moment the characters were to start like talking in 2024 dialect, you yeah. wouldn't even be surprised yeah. and it wouldn't feel wrong. It doesn't feel yeah. like all, there are a couple things in there that I think that if someone were reading it looking for anachronism, they'd be like, that's an anachronism. But I don't think it is. I think it's on purpose. I feel like it's yeah. to create a modern sensibility and to remind yeah. the reader that even though this story involves two sapphic women a long time ago when it wasn't safe to be queer, these yeah. people are safe because we're in a 2024 yeah. mind. Like, I really do think that it's on purpose to create, like, a bubble of, like, warm acceptance. And that is, which is exactly what the character, the characters experience, is, like, warm acceptance from everybody in their lives, which is lovely to see. And I have no interest in whether or not that's realistic, right? Like, all I know is that it felt great to read, and I will read, like, literally anything he writes next. Um, let's see. What else is on my list? 
So both Courtney Lawn and Alyssa Cole have novellas. Yes. Okay. It's one of them is like that would be enough. Okay. And the other one, they were both in that Hamilton anthology back in like yeah. 2017 or whatever. And they're both gems. They're novellas, which is, which that's hard to pull off. You know what I mean? Like hard to get a whole, hard to do a novella that is also effectively a character study. Mm-hmm. And they both do it because they are both at the top of their game and they can pull it off. Erica Ridley, Perks of Loving a Wallflower, and loved yep. another sapphic. It was super fun. What it is, again, like very, it's like very in the tradition of like what we think of as standard historical romance, right? like England. Is, yep. And yet it manages to be like really, it felt really fresh while I was reading yeah. it. Like it felt, I felt like I was reading something new. I recommended that one for if you're finishing Pauling season, like the current Bridgerton season, that's a good one to read. Yeah. It's a complimentary to that vibe, to, to the Bridgerton vibes that you're looking for. Yeah, I actually think that and the Emma Alden, the don't, don't want you like yep. a best feel, like very, like if you're looking for Bridgerton energy, I think that, yeah. I think that those both do it really well. I really enjoyed both of Emma Denny's books. Okay. One of them yeah. is one in parts. They're medievals. They're queer medievals, which we don't get. Um, right. We yeah. don't, don't get that often. And so as soon as I saw there was a traditionally published queer medieval, I was like, I need it immediately. Like on my phone right now. With, and it's delivered. It's, first of all, like medievals are so out of fashion in historical romance. Like they're I, so, like we simply don't do that anymore. No. Which is bad because. It's fun. And, uh, but I think that they were so common for a while. Yeah. That the, just the back, just like pirate romances were like kind of alarmingly common for many years. And then nobody did them anymore. But I think you and I have talked about this before when there used to be a time when like every single historical romance author would have a regency and they would have a pirate romance and they would have, and they would have like the a medieval. And yeah. with Laura Kinsale, when you look at with Laura Kinsale's like yeah. catalog, it's all over the place. And I think that is something that we really lost when historical romance became this like reiteration of Jane Austen. And yeah, I think we need anthropology ones. We need the archaeology ones, like those looking around like the mummy kind of deal. Like let's remake the mummy. Also, because over they, and over, I don't care. Let's just remake it. It's a great, we, it's a great, no like, re- but we deserve. deserve. And there's no reason in the world why you can't make that like a new, like a nuanced intersectional yeah. story, yeah, like, right? Like, like, yeah, like there's like often the places where this archaeology is happening, like is not England, and it's like filled with brown people who probably don't want their stuff being stolen. And like, this is so you already have like something going on there. Yes. Oh. The Vikings are another one. I, I know there's quite a oh, few man. the law where you had to have a Viking romance. Like we're like trying to figure out like other specialties and stuff. Yeah. Like, and yeah, it's but yeah, so I was when I saw that there was gonna be a traditionally published queer medieval, I was like I was so jazzed because I yeah. really like that setting. I love Elizabeth Kingston's books. And and this is like a co her book both of them are like cozy. They they yeah. are cooking the energy. And the first one is basically a, it's um two men and it's basically a road trip followed by more coziness. And the second one is sapphic and it is there's like one of them is spends part of the book dressed as a man to do sword thing tournament. Okay. And like the other one is doing brewery thing. Okay. And like and breweries are like good medieval energy and swords are good medieval energy and so i was and also like anything like if it's like if it's a woman doing swords i'm like i did buy the book automatically and deal with the fallout later and these books both were very fun very emotional very cozy rooted in history but not in a way that i think would be like i like to google things and to learn things but like you can absolutely read those books without like you could emerge from the experience having learned nothing about medieval history if that's your goal. Which yeah. sounds it sometimes like that me that's absolutely my goal as reader. I'm like, I didn't just you know, let this whole thing wash over me. 
especially with anything involving science fiction. I'm like, I'm just gonna let it, I'm just gonna let it happen. Look, I don't need to know what they're looking. I don't need to understand the mining rights on this planet. Like, I'm just going to let it happen. I think that like, it's okay to approach historical stuff with the same attitude. Yeah. I just read a book that was super fun, but not a romance, but I thought it was a romance. And so like, I have all kinds of feelings about it. It's on The Emperor and the Endless Palace by Justinian Wang. And it's like so fun and so silly in camp. I had a I thought I was reading a romance novel. And I, it was and like, I guess at the end, it is not, I don't think it's a spoiler because anybody who had read even one Goodreads review probably would have gotten there. Yeah. Like, but it was so fun. And it's like a triple timeline thing where there's one in the present day, there's one in Imperial China, and there's one in like 1700s China. And as I'm reading it, I'm like, well, we could have, like, we could live in a timeline where we have ancient, like, Chinese romances every day of the week. We can yeah, do, like, yeah. I know Chingy Lin has a bunch, right? But, yeah. like, we could have, like, like, and, and also, like, that Emperor and the, and the Endless Palace, like, very rare. And, like, we could have not, like, we could have that. That is something that there's no valid reason for us not to have that, right? But... Yeah, we need a little bit of, like, different countries, different settings, like... Like, I love Chanel Clean. She writes historical fiction, but there's some romance pod because she used to be a, in Cuba. And I love because our Cuban history is very similar to Puerto Rican history. We were, we fought the same war. We got colonized by the U.S., but they didn't and all these different things. But I love the like, fact that, like, there's so much, like, Latin America hasn't been explored. There's, like, India, even Australia. But, yeah. You can look at China. You can look at Korea. Like, all this like all these different worlds that can be explored out yep. there like it's not just historical romance i feel like historical fiction is the same place yeah. it's a lot of world war ii and i'm like well there's more than world war ii yeah there's philippines like there's like so many countries that we can explore that have yeah. other wars or other things if you want to look at wars but there's other experiences that have death and information no, our first so, time. yes yes where it's, it is it's a missed opportunity, right? Like it's, yeah. Uh, and obviously what's happening, what, hap- what happened with historical fiction is similar with what happened in historical romance, which is at some point, they both became kind of synonymous with a certain time period, like Regency yeah. for historical romance and World War II for a lot of like book club fiction. And, and that winds up getting stale and turning off a lot of readers, even if the books are themselves like really fresh and interesting. Like it's, it yeah. becomes the like from the consumer end, it becomes something that you've already done before. Yeah, but I did read a World War One queer historical romance. I didn't really. It was, is it a historical romance or is it lit fic? It's in Memoriam by Alice Wen. Okay. okay, okay. So I didn't know it was going. I didn't know it was like a romance novel. I thought it was going to be like a gay war tragedy, and yeah. I didn't. Okay, right. And it's so good. Like, I cried. And, like, I can't believe that the author pulled off an optimistic ending that doesn't feel like it's earned. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's earned. In the yeah. way that you want it to be end- In the way that, like, in a romance novel, you want... There's an optimistic ending. You want it to be earned and not just because the author decided. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that's how this feels. Where it feels like both these characters work through... Like... They both deserve it. Like, they're happy for them. Even though we all know there's going to be another horrible war, like, real soon. And that any incremental change in, like, queer right that happened in the 20th goes away. Like, we know that, right? But it feels not uplifting, okay? But it feels, like, a very satisfying book. I'm bumping that one up. It's beautiful, too. Where It's also... I feel like, like, the tearjerker, right, yeah. at a genre has kind of gone out of style. Like, the kind of, like, books that are deliberately making you have an emotional catharsis as you're yeah. reading. Yeah. And this is that. Like, this book is there to make you cry. Like, yeah. it's really sad. And and I think I don't usually seek out that experience with books, although fanfic is different and this was really like i 
it's one of those books where I knew the next like five books I read were going to be like one star experiences because they weren't yeah. going to care, right? Yeah. And so I did the right thing and I read five terrible books. <laughs> terrible, but like I read five. I read like I read five books that like just the kind like we, like we were talking before like about like the kind of cozy mystery where like you don't really care whether it's good or bad. What you care is that there's somebody finds a body. And, that's some, and then somebody finds a murderer like that's that like that's all i wanted so just i did that really simple easy like easy to listen to you're just like it's a cozy experience it's a power cleanser you write five power cleansers that are just yeah, that's a power cleanser. Cleanser. that's exactly it and those books saved me and my relationship with the next couple of books that i read i am um, a lot of the books that a lot of the queer historical books that i find that i recommend and that get recommended in places where I'm watching, right? Mm-hmm. Or YA. Yeah. And this is something I have, like, I have too many children in my home, like, too many teenagers in my home, to, like, currently, to currently be much of a YA enjoyer. Yeah. But historical is a little different because it, feel, it feels like I'm not reading about present-day teenagers. Yeah. You know? You're not reading about Gen Alpha and Gen Zs. No, I think, like, I think that... I think that, like, my ability to enjoy, like, a Gen Z romance is pretty mem. You know what I mean? Like, I, like, it's, I'm just not, and I think that I, just because I'm not the audience at all, and I shouldn't yeah. be the audience. I think, you know? I think, I, I, I know, like, a lot of, and I just had another conversation with an author, author who said, like, why is either for teenagers and, and women, and adult women. But I feel like, I don't know, when I hit my 40s, I was like, I don't have, like, energy to a 15 yeah. year old going to coming of age and talking about her parents I, I i think at this point i've had enough therapy that i heal early for my parents and heal the trauma which is great but yes. that means i don't want to deal i don't want to visit this where the trauma what if it is like when i'm reading and these people have terrible parents i want yes. to cry like i want i can't deal with them. you know what i mean like where it's where urge, that's not okay and no. the proof is that i if i have to read about like reading about people doing SAT prep, okay? Yeah. When like the current battle of my life is getting three people to do SAT prep is not leisure. That is not recreation, okay? No. Or when it's like kids who are super ambitious and they've got it all under control and they're going to go to like their good college. And I'm like, not having fun with them. No, because you know what? I know their tr- I know their future. I am living that future. And I'm like, I, I have no purpose anymore. <laughs> I just like, I literally had to talk in therapy. I had an EMDR to talk about how I'm never achieving the next level, the next level. Like I had a hamster wheel in my head that mm-hmm. just kept running and I had to run it to the ground to be yeah. like, no, we're no longer doing that. Yeah. So no, I don't want to see what your future looks like because That's I'm so looking it. And, and I, yes. it is. This it is, is what it looks like to be 40 now. It is very like, I... Well, like, yeah, like, I don't, I don't want to stress about like their future therapy appointment. No. Like that's right. Like that's not. That is something. That is like the kind of reading experience that is perfect for other people who are in that demographic. And yeah. I love that for them. Right. Yeah. I love that we are currently in like. We currently have like there are so many amazing YA books out there. Like we are spoiled for choice. Oh. Yeah. The, like, I have three YA readers in it. You know what I mean? Like, and I love that for them. I love that for people who read YA. Um, And I will continue to, like, read sometimes historical YA when it is recommended so many times that I can no longer. Yeah. (laughs) But, like, that, like, I know people I trust. But, like, one of the, one of the, like, queer YA historical romances that I always recommend is Last Night with the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. Like, that is an amazing book on every level, right? It is, it has, like, you can I, you learn something about history, which is something I really like. But there's also this really strong sense of place and time, which, but without it being, like, you're not getting, you're not reading the Wikipedia page on 1950s San Francisco. Yeah. Right? Like, it's woven into, it's woven into yeah. the story. And it's just so, it's like the pacing is perfect. The book is just, the characterization is like so deft. I really enjoyed that. 
And we also have that series of YA retellings, like the yeah. self-made boy and yours ardently. And yeah. there's like two others, but self-made boy is the only one that I've read. And I feel like the fact that these books exist and are well reviewed and are enjoyed and get recommended every day, right? Like this is like this means there is an appetite. There is an appetite for, for it. Like publishers, like, they're buying some more of these books. And they're by and they're by big names, which is you know what I mean? Like all those books are by like established writers. Yeah. And and who writers who know how to tell a story and like do it. And I feel like the dis I know I keep saying this, but the disconnect there, right? The disconnect yeah. being this like well received, popular, well publicized like series of why historical romance. Okay. And then the for like regular old historical romance were like it's really in a slum. Like, please look at the difference between the two. Like, the like yeah. what, what's happening in the one is that it's, like, deliberately queer and intersectional. Like, deliberately, okay? Yeah. Like, come on. Maybe, like... maybe, as, maybe as the Gen Z gets older and they yeah. continue to demand, we'll see you more. Because I guess our millennial and our Gen X are, like, we're, like, yeah, we're just we 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 live so many unprecedented times that we're just like not willing to like we can fight it, but we need somebody we need a vocal voice who's gonna do like the real vocal voice on these issues because we've yeah. dealt with like some bigger issues like recession, nine eleven, school shooting, right, 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 burnt out, a little bit burnt we out, burnt out. We had no. a pandemic. Right. <laughs> oh, but it is like it is. But yes, I, yeah. and again, like, I am so happy that, I'm so happy that YA and fantasy are enjoying. I'm having their moment, yeah. Right? That, like, that they're, that they can, that they're allowed to have, like, the people who aren't white. Yeah. Get out the end. Yes. Like, it just feels, yeah. it feels like, it just feels like a sentence that should need, need to be said, right? Like, yes. But, but, yeah. But, like, right now, and it's, like, I always feel like whenever I encounter on right now, like my major social media is Instagram because I like don't have the stress threshold for anywhere else. And it's fine. And I feel like whenever I encounter a reckless, right, especially because it's Pride Month, a lot of it is we want to make it like you should buy these books and read them to support the authors and like show the industry that like we have an appetite that there's an audience for this, right? And part of me wants to be like that, ah, right? Because I do buy all these books, right? But yeah. also, that's not how it works. Yeah. That's not how it works. Even if every single person who read that Instagram post bought those books, reviewed them in five different places, it's not going to move the needle. Like, the problem lies with publishers. Yeah. And what they are willing to believe of the market. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like, I, I feel like this is like... I obviously have like not been thinking about this for a while, right? But like yeah. several I've been mean, like this is like I'm like annoyed. And I have not talked about it, which is why I'm processing it all out loud. But it's a I think you brought a point. I think it's like it's understand like, okay, what's gonna move the needle? What's gonna move the stuff? Whether we get a runaway hit at some point that it's gonna open up the channels, like we're meant to see open up the channels this mm-hmm. way or it might just mean like we get editors who are like, oh, you know what? We're gonna be acquiring just historical so and so this, and they're gonna they're gonna make a call to all the agents as, as we talk on offline about another topic. It's it might just look like that where agents yeah. are being telling authors like, hey, they're actually buying these books now. Yeah. So start writing pitches and start putting it all together. And like it might it, we don't know how, or it might just mean like some NDs start hitting the top one hundred and then. They get acquired and they are making six figures a month and they're like, oh, the market is going for it. Like it, yeah. we don't know. We don't know the market, but the pipeline for publishing right now is a pretty lazy publish, lazy pipeline where you have to prove yourself worth so many times in order for you publishers to be like, oh, okay, we'll give you some money now. Yeah. 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 But, just, but now I'm like, there's two upcoming trans historical romances yes 
I'm like super excited about. One is a store thing. I do not know who the author is, so I didn't write it down. But it's okay. coming out really soon. And I think, I feel like I keep seeing good things about the arcs, but I'm waiting for the audiobook. And TJ Alexander has. Yes, one. I had heard about that. I love TJ's work. It's yes. so pure. TJ is such a great person to hang out to. So I am very excited for that. I. When I saw that deal announced, I had to like pace around my house for a little while about it. I was like so excited because all of their books are, well, every one is better than the previous one, which, yeah. is in, which is like, that shouldn't be possible. But Triple Sack, which I, did it come out yesterday? I think it came out yesterday. I got access yeah. to the audiobook. I'm actually excited to share. It's really good. It's like, I think that. It is kind of weird that we don't have as many, we don't have that many, we don't really have very many at all, trad published poly romances. Yes, which we need to. Because so, they're popular. Right. We yeah. have a whole genre called Why Choose. I know. Which is like, I know. And there are like, there's just thriving Facebook groups because I'm part of that. Yes. There's like 20,000, 100,000 people reading Why Choose. Like, like there's no one yes. missed this. And it's like, and I again, it's a disconnect there, right? Between like trad publishing and like yeah. very clear like interest in readership. Okay, is wild to me. Yeah. I don't know if it's because why choose sound like 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 it doesn't doesn't like does it sound like it's not polyamory? Like do you know what I mean? Like is it like is there something going on there? But. And also, meanwhile, I feel like a solid, at any given point, like a solid 25% of queer people I know are poly. Not like you that. Know, you know, like a niche have, thing. We have Peacock show coupled to throuble. So we're <laughs> not good. So we're moving away from the sister wives. Mod and then the couple to throuble motto. Right? A it's much better like, motto, because obviously I want to see the downfall of the sister wives got. But obviously I don't want to have that. Like, that's not the way choose I want to. That right. wish right. version of it. That's not right. what it's for. Right. But we got a couple of throuple, which is like, oh, well, we're going to try to figure out, do we go to a couple or a throuple? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's obviously having like, like it's like that concept, right? Like either yeah. open relationships or like an actual like, yeah. throuple, right? It's like something I feel that in the past like five years or so has moved from being something we don't talk about to yeah. like, like pretty normal. Yeah, yeah, like I think I don't like. I finally come to a turn. So I don't like love triangles. I I don't mind cheating. It's cheating is not the issue. I don't like love triangles because I'm like, well, why choose? But why yeah. you have both. Like, can that your work? Like, what? Why do we have to have this aim? So, like, or should I choose one? Well, don't choose. Oh, they all have something. Y'all have something in common, right? Like, you think you can make it work. You have a poly relationship, and we try. It's it's so like. To see a really well executed, yeah, poly romance, like yeah. really nice, and I can wonder how they were going to pull off pacing, like based on the, you know what I mean, like how, like not that poly romances inherently involve a pacing problem because they don't, yeah. but like I wondered how that was going to work, and because also because T.J. Alexander didn't really do on like high angst third act breakup like so how is yeah. this going to work when you have two which like fit in this book it winds up being three separate relationships right because it's like with each individual person and then with like a couple and then and like but without there being like big drama like which often is used knit different threads together right yeah. and no like this book reads like like a poly relationship is the most natural thing in the world to write about. And I love that because yes, like where yeah. it's, it's, so it was, it feels like an important book. I feel it's super satisfying. Again, like incredibly hot, like right from the get go. Nope. No bunch is full, nothing left on the field or whatever the metaphor is. But like it was, and it was like, and again, very fun, like very, like a lot of, like you get a, all of their books, you get the sense of like place, right? And yep. so, and like in this case, and the food, the whole food industry. I yes. Ever watch from T.J. Alexander. Just so and hungry. Like, right. I didn't even really drink. And when this book had me curious about cocktails, like 
I feel like the last mixed drink I had was probably a gin and tonic in like 2005. And like, and yet I was like, oh, very interesting. They're going to use like an egg white float. But so, but yeah, I am. Um, so there's, yeah, the fact that we have like two upcoming trans historical romances is like, I feel like that's great news for me to read them. It's great news. It's like hopefully great news about like what the state of the industry is. And what, yeah, I'm, I'm like looking for good news. And there, and I'm like, the fact that I've only heard of me, they think about it, it's a short thing. Like, now I'm really looking forward to reading it. I am looking forward to reading those. And so, Kat, tell us where we can find you online. Sure. I'm on Instagram at Kat S. Wright. And my website is catsebastian.com. The best way to keep in t- like, to keep up with whatever I'm doing is my newsletter and the sign up is on my website. I think we send a newsletter out once a month. And it winds up being 10 times a year. As long as I forget. Oh. Awesome. Thank you. And I have free stories and whatever. Yeah. Thank you, Kat, for being on the show. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Watch We Next podcast. If you enjoy our bookish conversations and want more recommendations, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Also, head on over to the Watch Renex blog for a list of books mentioned in today's show. Happy reading!